Hey, I'm Alicia, your non-monogamous relationship coach. Welcome to the podcast where my friends and I chat about our relationships, enthusiastic non-monogamy, polyamory, swinging, kink, and our lives. You'll get a candid peek into what makes it worth it to live life outside the box. And in case you're still wondering, nope, we're not monogamous. Hello, hello, hello. Today I'm talking to Dr. Jolie Hamilton again. You may have heard her on episode 21. Jolie is the relationship coach for couples who color outside the lines. She's a research psychologist. She's a TEDx speaker, uh, an ASEC certified sex educator, and the uh, author of the best-selling book, Project Relationship, The Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love. Jolie is also the host of the Project Relationship podcast and is also just someone that I freaking adore and admire. Today we're talking about how to differentiate your needs and wants and desires and 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 how that shows up in long-term relationships that are opening up or have been open for a while and just god it's so good. You're going to love this. Enjoy the heck out of this episode. It's fantastic. We could probably talk all day long. I also want to give a quick shout out to Heather SG for signing up for our Patreon and being a friend with benefits to Nope, We're Not Monogamous. Heather's getting uh, all of the exclusive content and uh, sex tips from all of our all of our guests on the show and everyone else who is a patron, uh, patreon.com slash not monogamous, if you want to go check it out. And also, if you enjoy this episode, please leave us a review or stars or a thumbs up or whatever app you use to listen lets you do. That would be super helpful for me. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. Enjoy. Because why wouldn't I? There we go. <laughs> Technology and I. All right. One with each other. Yes. <laughs> Magnificent. Um, I'm super happy that you're here. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I was so glad that you wanted to chat because like we had a blast last time. Uh-huh. I was riding that high for a while. So uh-huh. yeah. I'm like, yeah. this is good. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So um, anybody who hasn't heard episode 21 should go and listen because it was really, really good. But we're going to do more. We're going to talk more. We're going to. We're going to chatter at each other some more. <laughs> We're going to go, like, we, we can peel back the layers now as we get to know each other. Uh-huh. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. People can just, just listen to this relationship unfold. <laughs> exactly. Totally. I think that's the thing. I love doing, I love doing ep- this, like a meta conversation. Yeah. We're having a relationship where we talk about relationships and then someday we'll finally get to meet in person. Someday. <laughs> and God knows what'll happen. Who could say? <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Um, (laughs) So um, I'm curious about, well, first I want to ask you, I'm curious about the work that you are doing right now. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. I got like two really big, like um, if I wish it weren't such an octopus, it's not really eight arms though. It's like two big arms that have multiple arms. Um, One, I'm deep in my research. Um, I'm a jealousy researcher. And so I've been really deep in not only what the literature tells us, which is important, but also performing my own studies in jealousy. Um, And specifically this time, I'm doing a comparative analysis between monogamous individuals and polyamorous individuals and how they deal with jealousy differently and Mm -hmm. what we can learn from each other. Because that's like, that's it. For me, I'm like, Let's stand in the bridge space and everybody get better at relating, regardless of how many partners you want to have. Um, So that's really exciting. New stuff Mm -hmm. happening there. And noticing the massive uptick in jealousy research that's happened over the last couple of years, like really, really massive. Like I just had to print out literally over a hundred new papers that I found that were relevant to my body of research Mm -hmm. just since I last updated, which was less than two years ago. So that's huge. Wow. People are out there doing this work and not just from the monogamous perspective. Yeah. So exciting. So that's, 
Yeah, I'm super jazzed about that. And then on the other side of my octopus is, um, <laughs> you know, I've been building my, my group coaching. And so working with couples who are opening those long-term relationships mm -hmm. in particular, like that's my specialty. And it, I mean, it makes sense. I had, as you did, you know, a long-term relationship that then didn't work in the uh -huh. transition and now doing long-term again and making it work. Yeah. And so yeah, working with people who want to create something new, want to like really reimagine is so fun, but also brings up all my own stuff too. It's oh yes. It's an interesting Here's place your work to stand for Here's yourself. Your work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like just stand in that for a while. I'm a big fan of like you can't do you can't do really great psychological work unless you're you get in the container. Yeah. Get into that alchemical vessel, <laughs> soak it up. Now yeah, we'll just turn up the heat. Transform. <laughs> exactly. Al alchemize. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. It'll only hurt a lot. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Here for it. Um, okay. So that is a thing that I have been talking about a lot with people is one opening the relationship and like what what do we want to create it to be now what is it going to look like um and then two that brings up all the things that the people in the relationship didn't realize were things or that it was easy to brush under the rug or that they could just kind of ignore like no big deal this is just part of relationships we'll just put up with it and now they're like oh now we have multiple relationships and maybe we should do something about these things that are coming right. up. <laughs> right. And that's, that's the best case scenario. We yeah. notice all this stuff, all these, um, dust bunnies under the edges of the, the, yep. the, uh, the bed. And we say, oh, we should, let's, let's see what we want to do about that. But the worst case scenario, what I see pretty frequently is we can go a long time, just like adding a little dust ruffle and like pulling the car covers down a little lower Meanwhile, building new relationships that don't have these same dust bunnies, that don't have these skeletons in the closet, don't, don't carry those issues in part because we have been doing our work, but also because every relationship is different. So it's going to have its yeah. own things. And so what I notice a lot now is when people are opening, there is a moment when they can realize that this is one path toward having their, you know, their say original for the purpose of this discussion, their original mm -hmm. relationship level up, shift gears, really become, um, the way I put it is an individuation container, like do your work, get yeah. into it. Yeah. Or they can decide to reimagine that relationship as not that maybe it is going to be messy. Maybe it's not even going to last. And that's a way of reimagining too. And saying like, oh, it wasn't as good as I thought it was. Yeah. Now I can see things that I couldn't see before. Maybe it doesn't serve me anymore. Yeah. It's not, none of these is a bad answer, but what I noticed is a lot of people miss the opportunity to really evaluate it and to say mm -hmm. like, what are we seeing here? What, what is happening? What's going on? Ooh, that's good. How, yeah. how would someone notice that opportunity and what would they do with it? Yeah. So, okay. There's one way to <laughs> notice the opportunity that, um, if you see an uptick in behaviors that used to be fine, they just flew under the radar and all of a sudden they're driving you bonkers. Mm. Like if that dial has turned up and all of a sudden those things that used to be just, eh, this is just how they are. Yeah. You're generally speaking, we're going to see them in our partner, not in ourselves. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden there's an uptick. What I want to say is that's my first indicator. Like that's a really early warning light that it's time for me to just evaluate the status of the relationship because those things start to build up. Like those go mm -hmm. into the resentment bucket, which yeah. also in my trauma brain turns into my threat bucket, right? And oh, all those yeah. things now start bugging me that didn't bug me because I had nothing to compare it to, no place to go to sort of be away from that and, and not see it, not have it in my space. So noticing when we're starting to feel overwhelmed, bothered, irritated, even aggressive about those things that used to be okay. Just noticing and saying, so just because I'm seeing it out in my partner doesn't mean it actually has anything to do with my partner. That's my invitation to my work Yeah, because I can't 
force my partner to change, I can, we can start a conversation, but really that's the invitation. So noticing it early is the trick because the mm. longer it builds up now, I'm now I'm building up stories around, around this thing. Like here's a behavior. Let's just get really specific. So, um, if my partner absolutely every time forgets to plan appropriately when we're going to leave the house. And so leaving the house becomes this like total drag on me. I can't leave on time. He doesn't have his stuff with him. Um, he just like, he's disorganized Yeah. for 13 years. That's been okay. All of a sudden now it doesn't feel okay. <laughs> that's my invitation to get clear about, yeah, he didn't change. Actually I did. Mm -hmm. Something's not okay over here. Is it the beginning of a conversation about the behavior or is it the beginning of the conversation about what is really changing? What's going on in me? What am I, why am I noticing this? It's an, it's a great opportunity, Yeah. but we could make it just about whether he gets his stuff in the car on time. And that's Which a probably what, that's the easy thing. Well, exactly. Not in and the long you, run, but easy. <laughs> right. And if you go to a, a, a traditional counselor who like, isn't there to deal with your openness, they're likely to focus on these things if, from a monogamous mindset, right? Yeah. And they're, yeah. they'll see it in that context and say, okay, well, let's either work on acceptance or let's work on communicating our needs better. And those are all, they're all useful, but missing the fact that this was fine. It's not fine anymore. And now I'm projecting stuff out onto my partner. What is it that I'm projecting? What is it that I can't stand about this all of a sudden? And for me, that's, that's the chance to get in there and say, is this about an unmet need? Is this about something I actually need to change? Or am I actually starting to devalue a current partner because I'm not paying attention to how I manage NRE? Is it that I'm not actually tuning in and being grateful and showing my gratitude toward my partner? Are they not? Are they actually, is this one of those situations where we flipped the script and he's now resentful? of me spending more time away. And so now we have to have a new set of conversations because he's actually acting out, mm. hoping for attention. Yeah. But there's so many things that could be under the surface and all of these are wonderful opportunities, but we can miss them so easily. Yeah. 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 I feel like it's super, super easy to just look at the, the symptom and go, I just wish you would change and make this easier on me. <laughs> right. Right. Like just, just be better. Just be better. And, you know, I guess to some extent that also means that it's the, in that moment of frustration is also the time when our partner could say, it sounds like we need to really, we need to revisit what goes on in our relationship. It doesn't really matter who begins that conversation, Yeah. who notices yeah. it. It matters yeah. that it gets noticed, right? Because mm. once we start the exploration, now, now we move into the real work of how is being not monogamous, right? Like whatever form of that you're doing, yeah. how is it shifting who I am as a person and what I see about the world, what I expect from the world. And now I can actually use it as my, my individuation work, my coming into authentic, fully self-expressed me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, the thought that came to mind for me was at that point, I, I feel like people want to know, well, one, people want things to just happen fast and easy. We want a solution right now. Let's fix it. Right. Yeah. Which is not usually how that works unless we're talking about who's going to pick up the groceries or whatever. Right. Right. <laughs> So it's like, okay, so now we, we recognize that there's this, this thing happening, some change is happening. And now what do we do about it? Do we have to make a decision right now? Do we have to like, what do we do? Right. Because I, a lot of times the, the looking for that fast solution means I want to go backward. Yes. I want, I want it to feel the way it did fix it, but we've introduced new elements so yeah. is that actually the appropriate move? Is that actually going to get you what you want? Because like your body, your nervous system, all of your, you may want new things, but your, but your, <laughs> your basic protective self is going to head back towards this used to work, put it back, fix it, make it feel right. Safe, again. safe, secure, make me safe, yeah. make me safe. When 
mm, safety is super important and we got to stretch out to the edge of that in order to grow. So yeah, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's juicy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's this is, juicy. this is where my, all my time spent in CrossFit really informed how I came into non-monogamy and <laughs> the thing that we say all the time, just be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's yeah. the only thing you can do to get through a really hard workout is just yeah. be okay. Like, and I used to tell people, you know, so we'd be doing a super, super intense workout. And what I would say as a coach is I hear you fighting, like they'd be fighting themselves. They're, they're starting to cry. You can start to see like their faces falling. They're starting to frown. Mm -hmm. I'm like, say yes. Just, just say the word yes to me. And, and they would say yes. I'm like, okay, say it again. And they would vocalize this a couple of times. And all of a sudden, everything starts to shift, right? Their yeah. shoulders move back again. Their face, they, they literally change their nervous system response by entering in, by, by reminding themselves that they agreed to be in this uncomfortable position. They agreed to run the mile and then do 100 pull-ups and then do 200 push-ups and then do 300 squats and then run another mile. They want that. It's the same thing in non-monogamy. I agreed to show up for this discomfort and to learn from it. And that doesn't mean I can't renegotiate. When things get tough, we can. But if I can't say, yes, I want to enter into this more deeply, there's the missing opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, really deep breath. <laughs> it feels really relevant. <laughs> I mean, it's relevant to me every day, every yeah. day in my own relationships, every yeah. single day. Yeah. Oh, right. My parenting I, um, too. <laughs> oh God, right? Seriously. I was talking to a partner the other day and he said something that was really, um, just really lovely. He was, you know, dealing with some feelings around things and was like, well, ugh, how do I make you change your behavior so that I don't have to be uncomfortable? He was like, damn it. That's not a thing I could do. <laughs> I'm glad he said it out loud. There's the thing. Like if you yeah. can get the words out uh -huh. Uh -huh. and then you hear yourself like, oh, oh, that's Erg. not actually how we do relating. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And now what? Yeah. Now what? Because yeah. what a, what a beautiful moment. I mean, that is, that's the entry point to moving out of that adolescent phase which yeah. we all still have our inner adolescents. We don't just have inner children. We have inner teenagers and they are a pain in the ass. They absolutely <laughs> expect us to have, like your partner should change to make me feel, of course, why yeah, not? Obviously. Why shouldn't Easy you change solution. to make me feel better? Come on, duh. <laughs> it's what I asked for when I was 15. Right. And that worked out so well. Oh, wait, wait, it didn't. <laughs> but it's reasonable to, to get the words out. It's uh -huh. what you do right after those words come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Seriously. I was just like, can you say that again? Because that feels really profound actually. Like, like, yeah. it, like, like turning it over and going, Oh man, I know that feeling. <laughs> right. And then you can sit with it together and be like, this is what I want. And a want for me is it's, it's really malleable. It's, it's a, it's a want it. I don't have to have it. It's, it tends to be really specific and really narrow and it doesn't, it's one way of addressing a need, but the deeper need underneath it, that could be met a ton of ways, many of which do not require our partners to change yeah. Yeah. or at least not to change their behavior. It might require mm -hmm. our partners to be patient or to open their hearts to our, our tender feelings, mm -hmm. but it doesn't require our partners to just, just do it different. Yeah. Just be, just be different. Just be different. <laughs> I love you unconditionally. Would you just be different for me? Yeah. Here's the condition. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, me too. I get it. The other day I saw a, a reel that you did talking about that wants and needs and desires. desires. I was like, yeah. Ooh, that's really good. That was really good. It's helpful to me because we use these words, right? Like we talk yeah. about like, you should have your heart's desire or your needs should be met or mm. go get what you want. And we say these like bold statements, but unless you start breaking it down, I find it helpful to analyze things. Yeah. That's Weird. just my Researcher. way. Strange. If I break it down, I'm like, oh, when I noticed that my, my needs were high level and could be met many, many ways, all of a sudden I could 
problem solve for myself. Yay. I can resource, Mm -hmm. but I can also now turn to not just my lovers and my partners, but my friends, um, my confidants, my therapist and say, I need help. I can't figure out what I want, but I do know what the core need is. Could you help me imagine bigger? Could you Mm. help me just like dream into this and see what are the options that I can't see? And now all of a sudden my my wants list is broad and varied and my partners can pick and choose ways that align for them. This becomes such like so much more generative ground to be in. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then there was, you had said, um, you had defined desire differently. Yeah. Desires. Desires for me are first off, you don't have to share them. Let's just say desires are, they live in the imagination. Mm. Desire is about this, this felt sense of, of an urge, right? It's embodied. It's an urge, but it may be that you only want it imaginally. It may be that you want to act on it, but you're not sure how desires aren't necessarily wants because they're not specific or they might be super specific, but they might only want to be in the mind's eye and they might not want to be shared at all. It, mm-hmm. If you think about desires, they're like, they're archetypal. They are, they live in these like deeply felt patterns of our, of our being, right? They're, they're human, but they might be things that are physically impossible. Even like they might, mm. they might range way outside the realm of this three-dimensional world that we are living in. And so a desire, it really becomes, it's delicious ground to explore, but it's not required to live it out in real life. And it's not required that we share it with our partners. They can be incredibly personal and juicy that way. It can fuel all of that need and want stuff. And then if you meet somebody that you can go deep and share desires without the pressure to make them real too fast or to make them real in a specific way. I mean, that's it. Like now we're in imaginal space. Yeah. Yeah. It's really magic. Oh, that's so cool. So I was, (laughs) so when I heard you talking about uh, wants and needs and desires, I kept thinking of like menus, like going to a restaurant, right? Like I want tacos, but I don't necessarily have to go to a Mexican restaurant to get tacos. I I can get tacos at Jack in the box. Like, Like there's lots of options for that, but like, I really need water. So wherever I go has to have water. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) If I go to a restaurant and they don't have water, I'm going to have a significant problem that will have to be resolved before too long. That need can't wait too long. You could delay it. Sure. So you could go without that. You can delay a need, but if we go without it for too long, we wind up with a functional problem in our being, Yeah. whether that be our physical being or our emotional embodied being, Hmm. it can't be delayed. So, I mean, I would, I would definitely say that feeling loved, feeling accepted, belonging, let's go like take it a a layer deeper, feeling belonging, whether that's with one partner or with a community or in your family or however belonging happens for you. Yeah. You delay that too long. We're going to have some issues, even a hermit, like even a spiritual person who has like separated themselves and isolated. Well, they have belonging to a greater universe, right? Like, so that to me, we're getting down into that core needs and then how you meet the need. You can get as creative as you want and you can take time And you could meet that need in a ton of different ways in different contexts, which is exciting. And over the course of time too, because we get to change and want to enact our needs in different ways. Mm. And then desires, it sounds an awful lot like you're talking about fantasies. Yeah. So there's a difference. Yeah. Fantasy is part of it. Fantasy is part of it. But some people don't fantasize in any sort of... (sighs) This is actually really important. I think the conversation that's going on right now about this is important for a community of people who are talking about making the life they really want. Yeah. Some people don't fantasize in their minds. Like they they have aphantasia. They Mm. do not um, have 
a brain that works in the way that like creates an image in their mind. Mm -hmm. And the reason I don't say that desire and fantasy is the same is because many people imagine that they don't have desire or that they are a desirous or they really, they, they, well, okay. The way that they often describe themselves Mm -hmm. to me in a coaching space is I feel broken. Mm -hmm. I don't desire anything. Yeah. What they mean is they don't fantasize. And usually what they mean is they don't fantasize the way their partner describes fantasizing. So their partner's describing these elaborate scenes that they see playing out in their head or is asking them to speak during sexy times and like, just say what you would do. Just say what you see in your mind. And inside they're like, what are you talking about? I don't see anything. I must not have desire. Yeah. But that's not the case. If you have aphantasia, that's not how desire would manifest for you. Your brain works different and that's fine. Desire. I think the Neil Gaiman series, the, the um, Sandman, yeah. if, you, if you watch that, desire is pictured extremely archetypally there, right? Desire mm. is just this, like this, this, oh my gosh, like I can't even, I don't even know how without images to really pull it up, but it's this looseness and this fluidity and this, this deep wanting and it might be sexual, but it might not. Yeah. And it comes right up from the inside out and it doesn't have to live only in the realm of mind pictures. Desire might be for another person. It might be embodied. They might feel desires literally as sensations in their body, Mm. you know, their cock might get hard. And that might be one of the signs that they are feeling desire in their body, or they might write, they might be able to actually physically with their hand, write out what they would like to have happen to their body. That's another way. Or they might be able to talk it out but in a step-by-step way, almost like role-playing without yeah. the role-playing, right? Like yeah. this, just talk out like, well, I would like to feel this and I would like to say this and I would like to do that. And this is all very different. And, the, and, and then so the next we, thing falls into place. Exactly. Because now they're, yeah, they're actually, they're doing it, but they're not trying to picture it first. They're yeah. just letting the words fall out, just yeah. letting the words fall out. And so these are like workarounds for people who have struggled to bring their desires to their partner. Cause this is so commonly what we're told, like, just bring your desire to your partner, create a safe <laughs> space, but Ow. it doesn't work that way for everyone. <laughs> and this is also why I think, you know, ah, pictures in the form of pornography or erotica, you know, the words, those can be super helpful because I might not be able to imagine it, but I might be able to go find it. Mm -hmm. I might be able to get the ping, the resonance of my desire. So if I, for me, desires right behind my breast bone, right, right behind my sternum, I feel a deep ping when an image out there in the world hits me and I'm like, oh, yep. That's what it's like hitting the funny bone only it's not funny. (laughs) (laughs) And now I know there's my desire. It's awakened. And instead of it springing from inside, it came out into me from the outside, it pinged on me. And now, now I might want to act on it. And now I might be having this experience of wanting to move toward something, some way of being, some way of touching, some way of moving my body. And those outside influences are just as much a part of desire as the internal ones. But in our culture, we've built up this idea of fantasy so much that we've made these terms synonymous And in doing so, kind of broken the conversation for a huge part of the population. Yeah. And I know this, I was married to somebody who had aphantasia. And when we found the word for this, I was like, oh. Oh, You literally don't see it. (laughs) Like, oh, this is why we can't have a conversation with my language because that's not going to work. Yeah. And there are ways to work around and still find desire, but we have to open up space to be different from our partner. We have to make space for the autonomous other, the sacred other to really be different in order for us to then say, okay, now in this space between us, (laughs) how are we going to create something that is erotic and juicy and delicious, whether that's sexual or not? How are we going to do that? in these very different ways. That's where magic happens. Mm, That's so good. 
Mm. I was picturing um, muses, right? Like when you see a picture or you read something, you're like, and that resonates and you're like, oh, that's what I want. It's like, a, like you, you encountered a muse. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I've known many, many clients um, and partners <laughs> and friends who have a muse in the pornographic world. Yeah. They like, they found at some point in their life, they found one particular star who they go seek out the work of because they're like, yep, that person, it's, it's, it's that person embodies. And in, in this is, this is the, in, in an archetypal sense, that person is carrying the, the carrying Aphrodite, carrying yeah. Eros, they're carrying it for me. And so I can see it out in the world and that allows me access to it within me. Mm. That's so good. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. And so having that is magic. It really is. In fact, yeah. I mean, my current anchor partner, when we were first really getting erotic with each other, he admitted that he had followed, he had followed an erotic laborer. He would followed her work for years because she reminded him of me and he'd known me, but we didn't have that mm -hmm. kind of relationship. We were just distant friends. And it wasn't until later. He was like, oh, that's why she had this ping, right? It, it, it touched that part of him. Yeah. The same part I did. It wasn't actually the two of us. It was, we both touched Eros for him. Yeah. And so there's so much information in, in what those images that we're attracted to are about. And we don't have to literalize it. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm obsessed with this person. It's no, they're embodying something that just lets me really be my full self, really have access to parts of me that are right at the peripheral of my shadow, like right at the outside edge. Mm, that's so good. So, so I'm curious if you take that into long-term partnerships that are opening up, that have maybe gone stagnant or flat, right? That desire isn't being pinged yep. it, there. And then they're, they're opening up and, and, and getting it elsewhere. How how do people, I mean, can you, can you, can you create more of that? Yeah. And then bring it home. You mean uh -huh. like create it and bring it home. So what I have seen, what I've witnessed yeah. is that people have the capacity. Most people have the capacity to turn up their own erotic energy mm -hmm. and then spread that throughout their life. Yeah. However, <laughs> most people turn up the erotic energy, and then imagine that it lives in the person that they find themselves desiring. Mm -hmm. And they go try to capture that person. Yeah. And so I have noticed a decrease in my desire with one partner. I open up, I get a ping, I get this, this resonance. I see it in this other person and I accidentally assign them my desire. It's mine. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's my desire, but I accidentally put it out there. I imagine that they are the carrier of it. And now it's really easy for me to imagine that I want this person instead of that person, mm -hmm. because also we have all of our monogamous paradigm stuff weighing yep. on us, right? We just do. <laughs> Even if we've been living out of it for a long time, it's still there. Um, here we live in this world. And so now I'm practicing non-monogamy, but... I'm doing it in a way that solves a monogamous problem. I can only really have my desire live in one place. And it's not in me, it's in a partner. So if we can now instead, and this is, this is what I work with people on is, how do I recognize that, that, that sensation I'm feeling, the, the intensity of the like electrical current between me and my desired object right in that moment? Because they are, at that moment, they become objectified, right? Like yeah. <laughs> hopefully there's full humanity too. But in that moment, if I can then fully recollect it, pull it back into myself and say, thank you. You, you light this part of me up. Yeah. And, and just, just that turn of phrase. Thank you so much for lighting this part of me up. And remember that it's, it's your flame. It's inside of you. And you can be incredibly grateful and engaged and create a whole relationship with this person without accidentally imagining that they are your source of desire because they're not, you are. Yeah. It's all internal. It's, it's almost, it's almost disempowering. You're like giving away 
yeah. giving, giving somebody else the power for your own turn on and pleasure and desire and, and love when it's Ex all internal, you create it yourself. Exactly. And, and we, we do this all the time and we practice it right from the beginning. Yeah. Like in American culture, like this is like, all I see is, yeah. you know, I I'm watching, I'm, I have seven teenagers. Well, actually, okay. The eldest just turned 23 today. So I shouldn't say teenagers anymore. I've got adults <laughs> and teenagers and I'm watching them in the world, just even exposed to our <laughs> very unconventional life every day. Still, there is this one way we go out and we imagine that the spark we feel lives out there and we forget that it's ours. And then we forget to actually fan that flame in ourselves. Yeah. And before you know it, you're 30 years old and you're like, what exactly am I doing? Yeah. Or actually in the case of my clients, generally the women are around like 37 to 42 mm -hmm. and the men tend to be like 45 to 55. Mm -hmm. I was 35. So yeah. yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden like, well, wait, wait, is this really how it's supposed to be? It's because it is, it's disempowering. Yeah. And when we reclaim that, when we move back into relationship with ourselves, mm. now we can really start to relate to the other as a fully autonomous other, which also means I can fully honor myself, capital S self, right? Yes. Capital yes. O other, capital S self. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just talk like this so all good. day long, so... I, I love it. I love it. It's so good. <laughs> it's the depth psychologist in me. I can't, I can't help it. I like, I find my, my, my language reverts this way. And I think, wow, I, I hope that that makes sense out in the non depth world. But what I'm noticing is more and more of the people who come into my world. Yeah. We're ready. We're yeah. ready for this like up leveling of yeah. what relationships are going to be. Mm -hmm. We don't want that just like, we'll just We'll just try to hold hands for the next 50 years and see if we can make it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not enough. Just survive in here. Just, yeah. Just getting along to get along and we'll make it to the end. Right. Somebody will get a medal for us, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll be fine. I mean, fine. that is at core, the difference I see between my parents' generation and mine is more mm -hmm. of my generation. I see saying, you know what? I'm just, I just want more than that out of my relationships. But then how to do it still becomes intensely challenging. Yeah. 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 <sighs> so you take this flame, this internal flame, and you, you, you blow on it and you make it a little bit bigger. And then you come, come home to your longer term partner. How do you, how do you turn it on them? Mm -hmm. How do you unleash it on them? Oh. What, what a beautiful question, because there's no answer that won't get you in trouble sometimes. <laughs> uh huh. I see this in my own relationship. It took time to work out, like, how does this work with my anchor partner? And I see it in clients all the time. Some people love to have that flame carried home, like bring this home to me. It's like the mm -hmm. leftovers, please bring it home and share. That's the best part. Other people are like, Hell no. I do not want your leftovers. Get in the shower. Absolutely not. We have to basically press the full reboot button before uh -huh. we can re-engage. And it's not for me to say which of these is right. Yeah. But if I understand that that flame is mine, if, if, if I understand that and my long-term, say my nesting partner, my primary partner, whatever word you're using, if they understand that too, then there becomes less of this idea of, I'm just going to use like the least PC word, like this idea of sloppy second, like less of this idea that they're bringing home, like, oh, they got you worked up. And so I get, oh, I get what's left. Oh, no, 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 no. The fire was flamed. It was, it was, everything was turned up and it's mine. This is still me. We're talking about, this isn't about the other person. And, yeah. but it takes real, it takes a, it takes a leap of consciousness yeah. to enter into that because every monogamous story we're told tells us that that is wrong and that we're being used. And it's, it's like, we should guard against that at all costs. My experience is that nothing in my body actually requires that my body's wisdom knows that that's not true, but that 
but the stories I have collected over the years. And then every Christmas when I go through my rom-com binge phase, they get refreshed and I'm like, oh, oh wait, right, right. Uh, that's right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh and yeah. That's- you're, you're intentionally choosing to share it with them. Like that yes. to me seems like when I'm in my logical brain, that yeah. seems like the most wonderful and loving thing you could do. Like right. I'm choosing to share this with you. My, my desire, my, my turn on my love and attraction. Like I'm putting it on you intentionally. Right. Of course the jealous side of me is like, yeah, but I didn't cause it. Exactly. <laughs> and there's the problem. Uh huh. The jealous critter in us. Um, okay. Jealousy. I mean, sexual arousal has been understood to be part of jealousy since time immemorial, Mm. you know, go right back to the beginning of every tradition, find the jealous mythology, which is like almost all of it. Yeah. (laughs) And and sexual arousal goes right alongside with jealousy. And it's not like the prettiest, gentlest, kindest sort of sexual arousal. It's often an incredibly brutal sort of sexual arousal. Yeah. Because jealousy invites this mire of emotions, right? And the number one emotion named when we talk to somebody about jealousy and we ask them to describe it because it's a complex of feelings is anger. Mm. And so if you could imagine, like if I do an inside out thing, right? And I think about which of the emotions are coming forward, anger frequently comes forward. Yeah. And if anger doesn't, sadness usually sadness. does. Yeah. So now I have to deal with the fact that, yeah, I have this, this bright, beautiful flame to share and my partner may meet it, but not with their whole self. They might meet it with anger or sadness out front. And that's what it feels like and looks like. And yeah, it's because jealousy's messy and it's hard for most of us a lot of the time. Yeah. Not for all of us all of the time though, which is interesting in its own right. Because <laughs> jealousy can be juicy and it can be a great place to have some hella good sex. <laughs> I mean, yep. just can. So yep. <laughs> yeah, I try to tell people that there's no right way to handle jealousy because realistically, I've watched people turn that flame up because they're like, I see my jealousy. I'm going to invite it close. This is actually how I work with it myself. I'm going to invite it close. I'm going to do my emotional and, and neurosomatic regulation Mm -hmm. so that I can hold it. And then I'm going to let it burn so fucking bright. And we are literally going to catch fire in this bed. Mm. It takes a lot of effort, but it's remarkable. It's yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's remarkable. We have, we have lost some mattresses to that. So And then it's important for me to do the recollecting and remember that jealousy itself wasn't, isn't what caused it. I did. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I did. Yeah. I was the one enacting. Yeah. Oh, jealousy. It's so big. It's Uh so big. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) It's so big. And we invited in through the door. Yeah. We're like, welcome. Come on in. Pull up a chair. This means I love you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Obviously. I mean, that's it. I mean, we that's that is the number one thing. In all of my research, the 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 one thread throughout all of it in in the literature, monogamous, non-monogamous, and in every research participant that I have interviewed, everyone understands that you wouldn't be jealous if you didn't care. There's no point. Mm-hmm. Now, what you care about. That's different because sometimes that care morphs into control. Mm -hmm. And now it's not about love in any kind of healthy way. It's about, I want to control this because my jealousy is, has now thrown me out of a generative humanity based loving into a really just a threatened trauma based reactivity. Now Mm. we got to do some serious management. Yeah. Yeah. Starting with like even recognizing that. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, almost, almost none of my clients shows up and says, um, I have a problem with jealousy. I would like to work on that. I understand it's mine. I'm going to need to work on jealousy. Most of the time they come in and they have a bunch of feelings that they don't recognize as jealousy. Mm-hmm. And that's fine because 
I mean, we could make an argument that jealousy isn't even a thing, right. that it's just this word that we use to describe a bunch of other more primal emotions. And I don't really care. I like having the word because it's helpful. Yeah. But if the word itself is what's getting in the way of you dealing with your anger, sadness, anticipatory grief, and the shame that you feel just about having these feelings mm -hmm. in a loving relationship at all, fine. We don't have to use the word. Personally, I feel comfort in knowing that the jealous triangle, the fear of losing my connection to the beloved, all people at all times, it is present in every storyline. It's, it's normal. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I get to act like a jerk because of it. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. I'm wondering, I'm sure people are, people ask all the time. So in that case, does it then mean that if you aren't jealous, you don't care? Yeah. Okay. I get this question quite a bit. Yeah, uh -huh. I do. Yeah. So do I. <laughs> and there, there are, there's a multi-pronged answer to that because first off, not everyone has access to their emotions enough to know whether they feel jealous. So I've had plenty of people sit in my office and tell me that they feel no jealousy over their partner's partners. It's upsetting their partner. So it would actually be welcome in the room. And they still say they don't, they just don't have access. They have no idea. They're emotional. They're their window of tolerance for their emotions and their emotional self-awareness is very narrow. I wouldn't even say it's poor. It's just narrow. They're really only able to allow certain things to be known. Um, or they really have disowned the word jealousy completely. So first off, we've got all those folks and I was one of them. I mean, we talked about this before. My first poly triad, we decided to just totally not say the word jealousy. We thought that would be a good solution. Cool. Yeah, that didn't work out. So first we have those people, and then we have folks who are struggling because jealousy, sexual jealousy, or sensual jealousy, or intimate jealousy, however mm. you want to name it, just isn't a huge deal in the realm of problems that they have. Yeah. So it just doesn't rise past the threshold. They're like, I have a life. I'm, I'm, I'm busy. This is fine. But it might bother their partner that it doesn't bother them. Mm-hmm people who've done their work and they're owning their stuff. And so they have teased apart jealousy and they're aware of the fact that, yeah, it's jealousy technically, or they don't even use that word because they're like, well, I notice that I feel sad sometimes when this is happening, or I notice that I miss you when that's happening, but I don't really feel jealous because I don't feel any sense of entitlement to your body or any possession of you. So yeah, that's called doing your work. And so, and this actually describes my anchor partner perfectly. He, he really never had to admit to a big jealous feeling because he'd been doing a lot of personal work. Mm -hmm. And so he could name more specifically what the feelings were that were going on. And it was only after I got deep into my jealousy work, my like professional jealousy work that he was like, oh, in a way that was just another way for me to hide from the fact that I do experience jealousy, but it's not overwhelming to me. It's, yeah. I can manage it. And so now he sometimes actually will stop and pause, like when I'm re getting ready for a date or something and just let himself feel it. And I'll mm. be like, he'll just name it for me. Like, I feel jealousy right now. And I'm like, cool. That's really like, that's emotional growth for him is just to notice it because he could have just not, he could have just not dealt with it. And not, and because he was already doing the work, it was not going to be a problem in our relationship. Mm. God, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. And those are, there are even more ways that jealousy can hide. It is the slipperiest emotion I have ever met. I find it to be even more slippery than shame. It mm. slides into corners. It slips behind shadows and we don't have generative conversations about it in typical monogamous culture. In fact, that is my, my most recent research. That's the biggest differentiator that I found is monogamous folks don't have any place to talk about jealousy. And when they do, there are a whole bunch of presumptions. So, yeah. so in fact, a whole bunch of people's opinions and thoughts and feelings and being in jealousy isn't being included in the conversation because there is no conversation. Yeah. So we still have a lot to learn from jealousy. It's why it's such a generative like avenue of study. Mm -hmm. 
That's so good. Yeah, that that is a, a thing, right? If you're monogamous and you're feeling jealous, then either someone has done something wrong or you're accusing them of doing something wrong. Right. Either I'm a problem because I'm a jealous person and I'm not just lying on jealous person, great right. big air quotes around that. Yep. Um, and I'm bad. Or you are horrible because you have inspired jealousy and therefore that means you've done something wrong. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There, that's it. it. That's is, the whole conversation. Yeah. And now I, I I thought it was really interesting to watch. There there is some nuance happening. The more emotional intelligence people had and the, like the more words that they had to describe to me what they were feeling, the more that my monogamous participants were able to share what they were doing to mm. reclaim that jealousy and just say like, okay, I'm having it. I feel it. And I ask him to change his behavior or I ask her to do something different, but I do it as part of a conversation and we do talk about it. And that's where I feel like there's, we are making inroads in all relationship styles to just make this part of the conversation. Because yeah, on the other side, I see lots of people still showing up saying, oh yeah, like we don't talk about jealousy. He just knows what the rules are. <laughs> and we've never talked about the rules. <laughs> we've never talked about the rules. And those participants frequently just assume that I believe jealous of uh, the same things they do about yeah. jealousy. Like they, they imagine that the whole world has a certain understanding of jealousy when in fact it is incredibly misunderstood. Yeah. And I mean, I'm still learning about jealousy literally every day from a, an inside place as well as professionally. Mm. Jealousy is juicy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Oh, I love this. This is amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really fun to talk about this from the perspective of ideas, but, you know, I'm also reminded that the, you know, you, you asked about long-term couples and I think you can, there are all these things we can do mm -hmm. to like, to, to bring the energy home or to welcome the energy home or to, you know, look under those bed covers and see like, what stuff do we need to deal with? What is our non-monogamy highlighting? And it's okay for relationships to transition. Yeah. And I th that's my favorite part about non-monogamy is that for me, I value, and this is what I've seen across the board is valuing the ability to, tr to transition between relationship styles and, and figure out what you need with this person is valued more than longevity. So that, but that's the place where I find people who are opening up struggle the most is they're still trying to keep something. And even myself, I taught the way I talk about it. I'm like, yep, we're going to talk about opening up without burning everything to the ground. And that is what we're going to talk about. And sometimes the forest needs to be burned. For all I, the new growth. For all the new growth. And that is exactly what happened in my life. And what I like to provide is a space where we can do a controlled burn mm -hmm. and really allow it to show us who we are now. Um, Cause if I had had that, I don't think I would have gotten divorced the first time because it wasn't yeah. for lack of love. It was for lack of imagination of how it could move forward. Mm. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. That's what we're, that's what I'm always trying to help people see. There's no, there's no one path. Yeah million paths. Yeah. Oof. Mm -hmm. That makes my heart happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Oh, um, I don't want to take your whole day. So is I know there... it could go on and on. <laughs> I know exactly. So is there anything else that you would want to share with the listeners that I haven't asked you? Well, something that's been on my mind lately is that if, if we start having these conversations about non-monogamy and you live in a different area of the country than I do, I'm yeah. guessing that where you live, there is a certain level of conversation that can just be had publicly. Yeah. Not everybody has that. I'm in Western Massachusetts and I would say it's like, it, it's definitely not like <laughs> the Pacific Northwest, but yeah. it is safe for me to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Not everybody feels safe to have these conversations and it's yeah. not safe in all parts of even our culture, let alone the world, right? It's just yeah. not. But the conversation, everything you and I just talked about 
it all applies to all kinds of relationships. And so I would encourage anyone who felt a hit, right? Or is tuned into your podcast, which has a very clear name. Your messaging is utterly clear. (laughs) I would encourage them to just remember that it's 100% okay to take all of these skills and apply them and say, and you know what? Monogamy is still the right choice for me right now because there are a million reasons that that might be true. And I just like to say that out loud because sometimes I feel like, we get cast in the role of proselytizer, but I know that's not new and I know it's not me. And we can believe very strongly that this is a really generative way of being. And everybody in their own time will come to their own conclusions about how these principles then enter their life. That's, that's it. That's my soapbox. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Yes. I'm, I, I always say like, like all relationship structures are valid so long as they're what you're choosing intentionally with awareness of what your options are and who you are and and who you're engaging with. Absolutely. That's it. And, and if we give, if we give ourselves the time to gain that awareness, that's where we get pivotal shift in how relationships happen. Mm. And that's where we can move away from entitlement and possessiveness and into the kind of love everybody actually wants, but we don't know how to enact all the time. Mm. Yes. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm um, so people can find you. I'm going to put all your links in the show notes. Is there um, anywhere in particular that uh, someone should look to, to find your work? Yeah. You know, I think the easiest place to find me is to go to my quiz, go to joliequiz.com, J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z, because no matter who your non-monogamy guru is going to be, because <laughs> there are so many of us out there doing this work, no matter who it's going to be, you may or may not be ready to take certain steps. The yeah. quiz is just designed to help people figure out like how far along the path they are now, which helps you show up to whatever your next conversations are saying, you know what, I, I want this or I'm interested, but clearly I have stuff to learn. This is, I'm not there. I can't just jump. I'm not ready to, to take that leap yet. That's why I designed it. I designed it out of my research and it's a great uh, tool for people as they make their choices moving forward. That's amazing. I love that. Oh, I know. I've looked at it. I haven't taken it, but I think I'm going to because I'm really Go curious. Go for it. Go for <laughs> it. It's, you know, it's it's such an interesting thing for me even. I have taken yeah. it again myself yeah. several times just to see like, where am I it, in my own sense of safety mm-hmm. in doing these things? Yeah. How, in me- how enmeshed am I feeling right now versus Ooh. individuated? Yeah. I shifts day to day. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Mm. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's seriously a total delight. Thank you. That was Dr. Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening today. It would mean the world to me personally and would help us keep this little podcast going if you would subscribe, leave a review, or share this episode with your friends. For more personalized support with your own relationships, we can work together on a one-to-one basis. Just visit my website at aliciapain.com and schedule a free call to chat about life, the universe, and your relationships. Bye.